thousand generations falling down in worship, sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who gone before us, and all who will believe, will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. It's your name. Your name is the greatest. 
Today we're going to continue our series on the book of 1 Thessalonians, and uh, we're talking about standing firm, and uh, we are close to finishing 1 Thessalonians, but not finished yet. Uh, Last week we talked about the rapture and uh, how that brings comfort to the believer, and today we're going to continue talking about end times in 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to discuss the day of the Lord. Um, So today, uh, if you'll look up on the screen, my title of my sermon is Standing Firm in Clarity. As last week it was Standing Firm in Comfort, today it is Standing Firm in Clarity. Now we're talking about end times, we're talking about the day of the Lord, and uh, it was funny the other day, I was studying my message, and uh, I think it was Monday morning, I'm studying, and you know, end time stuff is not easy to uh, study, and it's definitely not easy to preach. And uh, so I'm racking my brain. I have like six or seven different commentaries open, and I'm studying, and I'm looking at this stuff, and, and you know, I'm pulling what little hair I have out as I'm reading through all this stuff. How do I bring this uh, you know, to the church, and how do I preach this? Uh, what does God want me to say? And uh, so I ended up texting Logan. And I said, hey, pray for me. You know, this is uh, what I'm preaching on for this Sunday. This is the, the topic, you know, uh, preaching on the day of the Lord. I'm preaching on tribulation. And, you know, uh, I'm just really trying to uh, find what God wants me to preach and what he wants me to say in this sermon. And uh, so uh, Logan said, okay, you know, uh, sounds good. I'll pray for you. And I was like, you know, maybe I'll just, I'll write the sermon and I'll hand it to you and I'll let you preach it on Sunday. He says, no, no, have mercy on me. And he says, uh, uh, what I'm doing over here is I'm just trying to figure out how to set up for a Nerf war right now. And I'm thinking, wow, a Nerf war. I'm studying tribulation. He's trying to figure out how to set up for a Nerf war. And I said, man, I missed those days, didn't I? I said, I missed those days, right? Uh, but we're going to talk about that today and, and kind of figure out what does the Bible say in First Thessalonians chapter 5 about this and how it can clarify things for us uh, as believers. As last week, we ended with talking about this idea of how the rapture should comfort us. Well, what does the clarity of this sermon, what does the clarity of this passage do for us? us as well. So we're going to be uh, looking at 1 Thessalonians 5 in just a minute, but when Jesus works, uh, he does two things. When he comes in, he does two things, and those two things are unites and divides. So let's talk about the uniting first. Those who have trusted in him as the Savior are united to Christ as God's children. We are members of his body and all one in Christ Jesus, as we see here in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. It says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. Listen to this wordage here, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. We see a uniting happening there. Then we saw last week that Jesus Christ, when he returns in the air, we shall be caught up together. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17 says this, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, never to be separated again as he finishes this verse saying this, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. When he comes in, he unites. He does a good job of uniting. This is what Jesus did, but there's also something uh, aside of him that he also divides. Look at Christ as a divider here. John 7, 43 says, So there was a division among the people because of him. John 9, 16 says, Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. And others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. John 10, 19 says, There was a division therefore again among the Jews for these saying. You see, faith in Jesus Christ not only unites us to other believers, but it also separates us spiritually from the rest of the world. Jesus said in John 17, 16, says this, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. This is a theme that's been coming up a lot within our Wednesday night service, within our Sunday night service, and even within our our Sunday morning service is that Jesus is different. Last Wednesday, we talked about how Jesus is holy, how God is holy, and he is set apart, apart, how he is different, much different than anything that we can imagine, anything on this earth. He is different. He is set apart. And here in John 17, 16, he says, they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. You see, there is a difference between believers 
who are looking for the Lord's return and the people of the world who are not. There is a difference. There is a division that happens there. And this is a theme that Paul would help us to understand in this passage. His purpose is to encourage us as believers to live holy lives in the midst of the pagan surroundings. Now, as Paul is writing to those people, they were going through some bad times. There are bad people around. There are bad things happening around there. And we can fast forward all the way to today where there are plenty of bad things going on all around us. Where we have to be watchful of everything that we put into our eyes. Everything that we scroll through on Facebook or on Instagram. We have to be watchful of our kids. There are bad times that are going on all around us. And Jesus says this, he's come to separate us from those things. Not to align us with those things. Not to say, how close to the line can I get? It's how much closer can I get to you, God? How can I get get more holy how can I attain that how can I get closer to you and in this he does this by pointing out contrast between believers and unbelievers in this passage after promising that Jesus Christ is going to come back again Paul warns us to be ready be prepared this means that we have to be aware alert and on guard you know it's funny because uh Georgia Bulldogs obviously is my team and one of the things that uh, they've said recently, and I thought it was very applicable to Christians, uh, Georgia is a very Christian team, I like to think so, um, but what they said is, you know, they've won the last two national championships, go dogs. but what has happened here, and what happens to many teams, is there's a word that's called complacency. And so what they've, they've deemed is their motto for this year is, better never rests. You know what I feel like as Christians, as we are getting closer to the end time, we are beginning to take a rest. We're going to see in this passage that he says, don't sleep, don't fall asleep, be ready, be aware, know what's going on. And for clarity's sake, we need to understand what the end times are like. Why? Because it gives us a fire for what's happening right now. You see, many of us, we punch our card and we say, well, I'm a Christian. I know that I'm going to heaven, so therefore I'm good. I don't need to do any more. I need to come and just do my one Sunday morning a uh, week. I just need to do the bare minimum. I don't need to tell anybody about Jesus. I don't need to do those things. And sometimes I don't even need church. Sometimes I, that's an optional thing. No, we need to be ever ready, more than ever right now, because as Jesus is closer to returning, there is a big deal happening here. And we need to understand this and this is what we're going to see in this passage as we talk about what's going to happen to those who do not know Jesus your friends your neighbors your loved ones I hate to say it but I, I have to say what's truth and what is in the Bible is they will spend an eternity in hell if we do not get out there and witness the way that we're supposed to. I think we have taken on a rest and we've decided that I can take it easy in my Christian life. I've been saved for 20 years, 30 years. I'm good. I don't need to do much anymore. No, there is an end that is coming and there is something that we are called to do in order to reach the loved ones of ours to, for Jesus Christ. We need to be ready, better never rest, and we need to stop resting as Christians. We're on the sidelines, not doing much, and trying actually to live like the world, which is what he has talked about many times in this passage here, is to not live like the world, to live for Jesus Christ. So that's my goal of what we're talking about here this morning, is to give you clarity of what's going to happen at the end time, but know that we should be making a difference in this world, not the world making a difference in us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you be with us today. God, give me clarity of words today as we speak on clarity. God, there's a lot here to unpack, and I pray that I would do that clearly for you, that you would speak through me, that we would see your words, that it would set a fire to us, that we understand that this world is not our home, and this world is not forever. It's but a vapor, and we're passing through, and we need to be living for you while we're here. The devil knows this, and the devil is trying to distract us. He's trying to make us sleep. He's trying to keep us from doing what we're supposed to do by keeping us so busy. God, I pray as we see what Paul tells these people of Thessalonica here today, I pray that we'll see it and we'll want to do something with this today. That will put a passion in our hearts. That as we're reading these words that he wrote to them, that we'll see that we need to do something with them. So God, open our eyes. 
Open our minds and open our hearts for what your word has for us today and help us to light the fire or light the fire for us that we will get on fire for you. There are many in here, myself included, that there's been times in our lives where we were just gung-ho. We're going to do everything that we can to reach the lost and dying world. And there's many of us that have taken a back seat now that have said other people can do it, the younger people can do it, the older people can do it, and we make excuses. But you've called us to reach this world. Lord, help us that we would get on fire for you, that we would listen to you. And when you're talking to us, when you're speaking to us, when you're telling us to hand that person a track or to pray for that person, that we would do those things because of what you've called us to do while we're here on this earth. This world is not all it's cracked up to be. And I pray that we would understand that and fully grasp that because one day we're going to see that it all mattered what we did here on this earth, what we did for you. So it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're looking in your Bible, we're going to start off with verse 1 in chapter 5, and we're going to see that clarity brings knowledge. There's a knowledge that comes about when there's clarity, and as he's speaking to them, again, he wants them to understand these things. I I want you, brethren, I want you to know these things that are going to be happening, and I just told you last week, and I just told you in the last part of my letter, as Paul speaks, I I told you of what's going to happen when the rapture comes, when we're caught up together in the air, but let's continue talking about what's going to happen in the end. And this brings knowledge. Look here in verse 1. It says, But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. If you're taking notes, I want you to write down this, that this clarity brings knowledge, and knowledge, what happens here is there is a knowledge of time. Paul refers to the times and seasons, reminding us that the day of the Lord is an event that is waiting to occur. And there's a natural curiosity when it comes to uh, end-time events. Many people want to know. Many people have asked questions. And people want to know about the rapture. People want to know about the rise of this Antichrist. People want to know about the rebuilding of the temple, the judgment of God during the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon, the second coming of Christ. And we've been given some information and not all. The, the term here, time and seasons, it was used in Acts at the time of the ascension of Christ. Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 6. It says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? See, there was not only a natural curiosity, but there was also a concern of the coming of the day of the Lord. Paul had already dealt with this by saying the rapture of the church and the resurrection of the dead, it was to be comforting. And the purpose of prophecy is meant to comfort. It's meant to edify. It's meant to encourage holiness and give hope. It is not to be a scary thing. It's not to be a, a, oh no, it's coming kind of thing. You see, Christians who do not understand prophecy, they're unstable and they begin to fear these things. I begin to fear the end times. I can't wait for the end times. I can't wait to be up in heaven with Jesus. But there are some people out there that are afraid of when it's coming. So what is the day of the Lord? Some might naturally think, hey, that sounds like a good thing. It sounds like a glorious, exciting type of day. But in the Old Testament, Through this day of the Lord, it was mentioned at least 19 specific times. And here, I'm going to give you a few of those that you can see on the screen. Isaiah 2.12, and I want you to see the kind of the temperament of what's going on in these verses. He says, For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. See, this is a day to humble that which is lifted up in pride. Look at Isaiah 13, verses 9 through 11. He says, Behold, the day of the Lord, it cometh. Look how it's described, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Look look at verse 11, and I will punish the world for their what? Evil. It says, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. 
If this ever describes our world, just think about these words here that there's evil, there's wicked and sin here, uh, there's arrogancy, there's pride that's going on here, uh, there's haughtiness of the terrible, there's all these things that are going on here that we are seeing even today. All of these things could describe our day right now. You go ask somebody, you know, what's the end times like? What's, what's going to happen? It doesn't matter. I'm good. And there's an arrogancy out there that it doesn't matter, that I, I'm all that matters right now, and all that matters is the here and now and the present. This is all that will be laid out. All that will go lay low and things will happen there. Look at Ezekiel chapter 30 and verse 3. It says, for the day is near. What day? Even the day of the Lord is near a cloudy day. It shall be the time of the heathen. Obadiah 1.15 says, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Again, this is not a positive thing. This is not an exciting thing. This is not a, you're going to get yours one day and it's going to happen to you and all the bad's going to happen back to you. That coworker that's been annoying, oh, one day you're going to get yours. No, it's a, I don't want that to happen to you. These bad things that are going to happen, I would rather you come with me to heaven than these things come and fall upon you. Then look in, New Test, in the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. It says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Doesn't sound exciting at all. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. See, it's a day of wrath. All the nations of the world are going to be involved. Israel is specifically involved, and so we see a timing that's going to happen here. But then the second thing is knowledge of method. It will happen abruptly. Two illustrations are given in verses 2 and 3 to show this unexpected nature of Christ's return. The first is that of a thief in the night. When Paul says it will come as a thief in the night, he's painting a picture or he's basically describing a scene of what's going to happen here. You see, no thief would ever reveal uh, the time that when he is going to strike your house. I know I don't know how many of you get knocks on your house all the time. We get knocks and people are ringing the doorbell and things and leaving pamphlets and things like that. And it's like, okay, uh, exterminators and roof companies and all these things. I've yet to get one that has a, a little post-it note on it that says that I'm going to rob your house tonight right that doesn't happen a thief doesn't come and knock on a door and say hey I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to come tonight I'm going to break in and and steal and and take some of your stuff they don't go to businesses they don't go to banks and say next week mark it on your calendar Uh, at 11 a.m. on Tuesday we're coming in we're going to bring guns and we're going to rob your bank they don't do that And that's the idea of what he's saying here is that it is a thief in the night. Someone that comes unexpected. Someone that does not announce. And that's what he says it's going to be likened unto is this thief in the night. This illustration was actually used by Christ himself in Matthew chapter 24 verses 43 and 44. He says, but know this, that if the good men of the house had known in which watch the thief would come. Thinking about this, if the person knew Have you ever thought about that? If I only knew this was going to happen, I wouldn't have gone here. If I knew I was going to get a wreck, I wouldn't have driven that way or I wouldn't have gone that way. If I would have only known, and I believe many people would have said, if I would only known that that person was going to break into my house, I would have stayed home or I would have set the alarm, I would have done this or that. He says, if the good men of the house had known in what hour or what watch the thief would come, he would have what? Watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore... Be ye also, what's that next word, church? Ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Be ready. Number one, it says a thief in the night. Number two, the second illustration that we see is the beginning of a a mother's labor pains. If you were to ask any expectant mother in her ninth month when her baby will come, she'll say sometime and hopefully soon, right? But it's an unexpected thing. It's a not knowing exactly when it's going to happen kind of thing. And that's the illustration that's given here. She will only know that it's coming when the contractions begin and when the wrath happens here. And the same is to be said in the day of the Lord. So there's a knowledge that we understand about what's going to happen. Time plus method equals knowledge and it gives us clarity. But let's look at the second thing now. Clarity not only brings knowledge, but it brings expectancy. 
And we see this now in verses 3 through 5. We're going to read verse 3 again and, and continue on. It says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, listen to the word is there, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of day, we are not of the night, nor of darkness. Remember I said there's contrasts that are happening here, and he's helping us to understand the difference between believers and unbelievers. But notice in verse 3, Paul uses the word they, and does not include himself in this. These people will be disillusioned, thinking that they're living in peace and, and in safety. And I believe that's where our world is even right now is, you know, everything's fine. We're good. We can live the way that we want. We have peace. We're fine. We have safety. We can do whatever we want. They, they push God out of the schools, push God out of, of everything. They, they just keep pushing him out of everything. And I can just live the way that I want. And there's an idea here of peace and, and of safety here. And it says they're going to be taken off guard. World peace has always been the dream of man without God. And know this, there is no true peace without God. This false idea of peace and safety is quickly replaced with destruction. This destruction will ruin their peace and ruin their safety. And again, this illustration of this pregnant woman, it shows the great pain that will go through in this experience. So these people, they'll be caught off guard. And think of other times where God has warned and man has ignored warnings. God only, he gave a warning about the flood and guess what? Only eight people were saved and they believed and they were saved from that flood. God warned Lot and his family and only a few of his family were saved there over and over and over and over again. God warns and we have his warnings in the Bible and people ignore and ignore and ignore. Because we as humans naturally we ignore warning signs. Think about it. Road closed. I bet I can get through there. How many have ever said that, right? I bet I could get through there, and all of a sudden you're stuck somewhere uh, in a pothole or something, right? Slippery when wet. Oh, I can walk across that, and a broken hip later, uh, and headed to the doctor, you're in trouble, right? Slippery when wet, I'm fine. Uh, wet paint sign. Oh, I bet it's not wet. Ruined shirt, ruined pants as you sit on the bench, right? And over and over and over again, we have warning signs and we begin to uh, fail to adhere to those warning signs because we naturally, as humans, we want to go against those things. And when it comes to the Bible, we go against the warnings that God has given us over and over and over again. Live like this, live like this, do like this. You have less pain in your life, less heartache in your life if you do these things, and yet we do those things. Instead, we do the opposite of what he's warned us against. And so they'll be caught off guard. In verse 3, it tells us that they cannot escape. No one will escape the judgment of God. They will try to flee, but there is no place to go. And we as Christians, through Scripture, we have an expectancy of what is to come. Paul tells the believers in Thessalonica that they are not in darkness. And I love the way he says this. You're not in darkness, okay? You're children of light. You're children of day. And there's a contrast here between believers and unbelievers. You see, believers long for Christ's return. We can't wait. We sing songs about it. I can't wait for Christ to call me home. I can't wait to go to heaven. I can't wait to experience his holiness. I can't wait to do the, those things. And there's a contrast here because unbelievers, they ridicule the idea of Christ's return. They mock it. They say it's never going to happen. This isn't truth. 2 Peter 3 verses 3 and 4 says this, knowing this first, that there shall come the last day scoffers walking after their own lusts. Are we there? scoffers walking after their own lust, people which do that which is right in their own eyes, and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. He hasn't come back yet, so is he ever going to come back? And they begin to scoff at the idea of Christ and his return. For us, expectancy allows us to not be overtaken like a thief in the night. I want you to think about how you view Jesus and his second coming. Do you long for his return. And again, this expectancy helps us to understand that this is going to happen sooner than later. And this is, there's a knowledge of the time, there's a knowledge of the method, and there's an idea here that we can expect these things to happen, even so now, Lord, come. But we see the third thing now, clarity. It also brings an awareness. 
This goes hand in hand with this expectancy because we're aware of what's going to happen. We're not foolish. We're, we're not given the answers. For us, these things are not going to happen. And all of a sudden, we're going to be shocked. Oh, the Lord is coming back and, and the rapture is happening. We're, sho- we're shocked. No, we have an expectancy. We know we have an awareness because God's word has told us these things and it gives us hope and it gives us comfort for what's to come. But let's continue reading here in verses 6 through 8. He says, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. See, verse 6 tells us to be watchful and sober, to be aware. The example here is used as is one that is sober versus one that is drunk. The idea is that one is inebriated while the other can see clearly. One is not paying attention, the other is watching. One is not aware, the other is aware. As I was thinking about this, my mind goes to security guards. I remember I was a security guard when I was in college, and I remember there was one, uh, a couple of times where I had to stay up late and watch, and, and in the first hour, you're good, you know, I'm good, I'm watching, I, I'm seeing when people are coming, when people are going, uh, the first mo- you know, in the first hour, I can see movement, I can hear sounds, all those kind of things, but in the second hour, your mind begins to wander, and you become less careful because you're distracted from your duty. By the third hour, you begin to feel very bored, and uh, there's inactivity. People are sleeping, which they're supposed to do at that time, so you become bored, and it's very difficult to concentrate. And unless someone comes to relieve you after that, you will probably fall asleep. And that's the idea of us as Christians right now, is that we have become less and less aware and less and less watchful. I remember another friend of mine that was a security guard. He was an older guy, and uh, a lot of the guys liked to goof off with him. Uh, but this guy was notorious for every single night. He was the watch guard for the, the whole night. So as soon as midnight hit, switch shifts, he was from one, or midnight all the way till about 5 a.m. And this guy was notorious for falling asleep. I mean, literally, he would be there an hour, and then he would be zonked out. So I remember several guys that were friends with him or would goof off, and they one day, literally, they took that wrapping tape, and they wrapped his entire vehicle while he slept through the entire thing and woke up in the morning to a wrapped vehicle and probably a security manager saying, what in the world's going on here, right? He was, a wa- he was not watching, he had fallen asleep. And many times when we see that on TV, people that do stakeouts and things like that, they get tired and they get weary and they begin to stop watching. And is this us as Christians, when we begin weary, we get tired. We've had some rough things happen in our life. We've had struggles in our life. And as time goes on, we begin to concentrate a little less we're going to focus on our problems and focus on what the devil wants us to focus on instead of focusing on him. And this is where we begin to slip. We begin to look at ourselves and only see ourselves and what we want. And we begin to not look at other people for the souls that they are that need salvation. Are we slipping? Are we sleeping? He says, don't sleep. Be watchful. Be aware. You know what? It's hard work, and I won't, be, I won't come up here and lie and say it's not hard. It is hard to live the Christian life, to stay faithful, to do what you're supposed to, but it is a choice for us every single day that we have to make to be watchful and to do what God has called us. Sleep is something that most of us enjoy, and your body tells you when it's time to sleep, so to go against that is opposite. Our bodies naturally crave laziness. We naturally crave not doing anything, but God has called us to not live a life of comfort, but to live uncomfortable here in this world so that we can reach a lost and dying world for Him. Watching requires much concentration as well as endurance. Remember when the disciples, they struggled in the Garden of Gethsemane? Jesus said, watch with me just an hour. Watch with me for one hour. And he came back to them and he found them asleep. Matthew 26, verses 40 and 41. And he cometh unto the disciples and he findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, what could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter into temptation. Enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I wonder if God's saying to us, could you not watch with me for a year? 
Could you will not watch with me for 10 years? Could you not watch with me for 20 years? Could you not watch with me for your life? Could you not watch with me, but yet you have fallen into temptation because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak? Jesus had also commanded us to to be watchful until he returns. And in this instant of the day of the Lord, the consequences of being found asleep as an unbeliever when Christ returns will be very great. It's not just a, hey, you should have been awake. There are great consequences that happen to the unbeliever. And again, this is what drives us to share the gospel with others. As a way of concluding, I want us to look at the last three verses here. And as we conclude this section, what can we take as believers from this? Number one is security in the future. As Christians, we can have security in our future that we are saved and not appointed to wrath that is to come, that will be poured out on the day of the Lord. Look here in verses 9 and 10 and see what God says here. If you don't believe me, it says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Praise the Lord. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. And then Paul closes this section at the end uh, of the end times, as he closed, just as he closed chapter 4. Look at verse 11 now. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Comfort one another. So there's security and then there's comfort once again. We're to remind ourselves of the good gifts that God has given us. We're to encourage each other to stay in God's word. We're to encourage each other to stay within fellowship, to encourage each other and to edify each other. Again, as times are getting closer to the end, as things are getting worse outside, we need each other to edify and to encourage each other. And then lastly, there's a warning here. So we see here that there's comfort, there's security, but there's a warning. We do not know exactly when Christ will return. So we need to be aware. We need to be ready. We do know that when he does, only his children will be going to heaven. All others are condemned to hell. So this is our warning to us. We have a job to do. Do you believe that, Christian? Do you believe that I have a job to do on this earth? And I'm not talking about your everyday work job. I'm talking about the work for Jesus Christ. It should not be stopped. You should be living for Christ Mark 16, 15, we'll end with this verse. It says, and he said unto them, go ye. And who is the ye? It's we. Everybody say we. One, two, three. He says, go ye, that's we, that's us. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I don't see a command here to sleep, to take it easy. I see that as the time is coming closer to the end, that we're ever to be more vigilant for Christ, that we're ever to be reaching people for Jesus Christ, because this is truth. I don't care if you believe it or not. I don't care if preachers are out there preaching against it or not. There is a literal heaven and there is a literal hell, and there are people that will literally be burning for all of eternity, and some of those are people that you could have witnessed to. You could have told about Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm saying that to get a fire within you, to be aware, and this is a warning, that we have a job to do. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and close our eyes. And we're going to end with that. I want us to think about that. And that is your uh, application for this morning. Uh, A lot of knowledge, a lot of clarity. Hopefully you understood a little bit more. And I would encourage you to dive in a little bit more. Go search the scriptures for what it says of tribulation, the day of the Lord, and and jump into it. This was one passage out of many that talk about that. But you know the Lord is returning. There is a rapture that's going to happen. There is a tribulation that's going to happen. And you know what? I want as many people that I know to go to heaven with me as possible. And that is our job to do. So will you take up that mantle? Will you decide, hey, I'm going to be on fire for God. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to do what I need to. That way I can share the gospel with others. Dear Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for this morning. God, we thank you for this word from 1 Thessalonians 5. So much power in it, so much clarity in it, but yet so much comfort in it. To see what Paul writes to the people of Thessalonica as they're struggling, they're trying to figure out what's going to happen in the end. Are we going to be a part of this? What's happening? What about our friends? What about our relatives? As he's clarifying these things, it also helps us to clarify in our own minds that we've got a job to do. So God, I pray that you would help us, each and every one of us, from the youngest kid in here all the way to the oldest adult, 
that each one of us can be witnessing, each one of us can be sharing your love, each one of us can pass out a track, each one of us can talk to someone about Jesus. It is not just for the pastors, it's not just for the Sunday school teachers, it's not just for the uh, adults, it's for teens, it's for everybody. We are all called to go into the world and preach the gospel, to tell others about you. We are your disciples. So God, help us to understand this. And with clarity, understand the end times of what's going to happen. Help us to be aware and awake and knowing that at any point, we could be called up. So we're thankful for that. We're excited for that. But also, our job is not done here on this earth. Our church is not done. We're not just called to come in here and just sing some songs and have some fellowship, eat some food sometimes, and just go on our merry way. We are on a mission. We are on a battlefield, and we need to understand that. So God, help us. I pray that these things would not just be words from my mouth and words from your word, but they would melt into people's minds today, that it would do something and cause a change. So we love you. We praise you, and we thank you for this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing one last song and just sing out loud the goodness of God. Every breath.